right, welcome everybody. My name is Laura Rankin. I'm the assistant director here at the Framing History Center. Uh, Annie's not here today. She's in Florida for her nephew's wedding, but she's sad to miss seeing you all, uh, but she's grateful to Access Framingham for filming for us today. Uh, I'm very excited to announce this is the first of our Framingham's top 10 exhibition programming. And we'll be continuing on next month with Suffragette and uh, Libby Frank, our storyteller, will be presenting on Josephine Collins. Then in April, former curator Dana Ricciardi will be presenting on Reverend Dr. Uh, Peter, Peter Parker in his uniform. And in June, we have a woman from Chesterwood coming out to talk about Daniel Chester French and the Gordon bust behind me. Uh, so that's just what's coming up now. There's a lot coming up in the future. So please uh, stay in touch with us and come to those events. Uh, so today, we have Stephen Taskovitz. He is one of the founding members of the uh, Middlesex County Volunteers Fife and Drum, and he has been living in Knobscot uh, since 1998. He grew up in Sudbury. Um, but today, he's going to be diving into the um, Thomas Nixon Jr. Tune Book. It's really important because it's one of 14 handwritten Revolutionary War era tune books in existence as well as, um, as Stephen has determined, it includes fife harmonies, which is very rare, and he'll talk more about that. Uh, so without further ado, Stephen Taskovitz. Oh. So before, before I actually start the regular presentation, I'm going to give you folks a little bit of a hint of actually what it was like and what an 18th century army actually heard. And it actually started first thing in the morning, even before the sun rose, when you heard a drummer in the distance playing some tune to gather everybody together. <laughs> He's also a fighter too, as well. Um, this one's yeah. lucky. <laughs> scary, huh? Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to actually try to give you a little bit of taste of what a musician in the 18th century did. And it's, it, it's a lot more challenging than you think. And even before I get into the agenda, I'm just going to start in a few things, just so you folks get an idea of how important um, the role of a musician was. So we represent right now how we're dressed as they answer the call on the 19th of April. We are dressed as what they call according to law, which means that we have, we have our drum or our fife, we have our weapon, because the swords are all that we're allowed to carry. Um, we have a backpack or a knapsack that has your, um, enough to take care of a couple or three days worth of bread, blanket, because we don't know how long we're going to be out in the field, and of course a canteen. That has to be a bottle and it's, it's a quart canteen. And bottle in the 18th century actually means quart. I just found out the other day. <laughs> so I'm going to uncover myself. So music in the 18th century, how important is it? Extremely important. So important that I actually want to start by getting a few quotes that have actually come from members who actually either heard the musicians, ooh, a couple of quotes from the 19th of April. We marched before them with our drums and our fifes a-going. Also, 
the British. We had grand music. We marched down over the North Bridge a little more than half a mile, and then on the hill we could see what was going on. Amos Barrett conquered. We marched by two by twos to the tune of the White Cockade, played by two young fifers, Luther Blanchard of Davis's Acton Company and John Barker of Brown's Company. A little later, a sudden volley from the British, Luther Branch, Blanchard Pfeiffer from Acton was slightly wounded. Some people have an idea that the post of a Pfeiffer or a drummer is a very easy one. This altogether is an error and found on ignorance. A Pfeiffer drummer has to fill the orders issued that he may be attached at any time in 20 different directions in a march where when upon the marching expedition against the enemy, the musician occupies a more dangerous post than an officer in attachment, save the commander, and when in line of battle, his position is not to the enemy. In a word, the whole duty of a musician is therefore not, a, not only a laborious one, but the one of the greatest hazard and danger. Washington, great man, loved his music. So in Cambridge, he took over the army, not knowing what he was going to, uh, what he was going to find, but he always commented on the music. The drummer and fifers in the regiment in and about Cambridge are to be ordered instantly to attend to the drum and the fife major at the usual hours of instruction. And I'm going to show you why. Okay, so we're going to give you an idea of exactly what it sounded like when Washington came upon his army. Yankee Doodle A and B. gathered a number of the New England militia, companies from all over, the, all over the United States that were coming in, at least along the eastern seaboard as part of the 13 colonies. Um, when he came in, there was no regulation to the army whatsoever, and he did not like what he heard, as you just found out. <laughs> because his next order is, it is recommended to gentlemen to provide regiments with good drummers and fifers. <laughs> okay, so today what we're going to discuss today um, is uh, fifes and drums came from somewhere and management of how, how the companies are managed um, is actually starts off in Europe. Um, it actually can say even further goes back to the Janissaries in, in Turkey, um, but we're going to just stick right now with Europe. Uh, we're going to talk about the fife and drum actually coming to the New World, which is here, um, and what it took actually to raise an army and how to control an army. The Age of Reason. Now, the Age of Reason is about, is about the uh, middle to about the end of the 18th century. So the, the half, the, um, yeah, start of the second quarter all the way to the fourth quarter of the 18th century. Um, so we begin to reestablish fights and drums that are actually used for control here in, in actually throughout the whole world, but in particular the United States. So I'm a field musician, what do I do? So you saw this part of it, I'm going to actually talk about really what the role of a fight for a drummer was, and it's actually a lot more, say we said, a lot more laborious than one would think. Duties of musician, what do they do? Well, you've got, a, you've got a little bit of a hint of that when we started off, is what the fifers and drummers did was actually, we were the field radio of the 18th century. We started off the day, we told you what to do, what, uh, when to do it, and how to do it, okay? So that's usually what the, what the role musicians did. And some of, the, uh, some of the clues that are in the Nixon manuscript, and actually you could say the long manuscript, actually give you some clues about how that day actually went go through what a musician's typical day is, and then what do they play? You can see some of the instruments we have here. We have some other examples, but um, pretty simple instruments, but very powerful in what they can do for an army. Um, what did I wear? So we're just part of this. We're going to, we represent a militia, but as the, as, the, um, as the war changed and it evolved, so did the dress of musicians, and there was a very good reason for that. And not only is it here in the United States, but it's also worldwide. 
And so, and I'll show you what the importance of a musician is. So that's the what do I wear. Um, and if you're interested, so you want to reenact. What are the realities and the fantasies about that? Um, as uh, Laura said, I've been doing this for 45 years. I got to the point now that I've been playing longer than some of my newer students' parents have been around. <laughs> That's when you know that the hair actually matches the color. So yes, um, so we'll, we'll get started here. Um, so you'll see some of these pictures here, and we'll, I'm going to use a Swiss example. Um, Swiss still actually, um, the United States and Switzerland actually have some of the more vibrant pipe and drum communities around. But uh, here gives you an idea of what fifers and drummers look like um, during, the, during the 1500s. And you can actually see the fifes being played. Notice that they look a little bit different. They're a lot different. Um, Joseph Morneau was standing in the background. Um, is a fife maker, a good friend of mine. I've known him for many years. And he's actually been studying some of this. And actually, it makes sense. And maybe that might be, um, might be another grist for another talk sometimes. And you can see that these multiple, um, multiple fights not played right. They do a, the fight is ambidextrous, and they're proving it. Um, and so that's how a European or a Swiss group would look like. And here you can actually see it being used in um, in Europe, um, in Switzerland. I can tell you by looking at the picture that that the army that is fighting up against the castle is from Bern. Reason? There is a bear on the flag. The Piper and Drummer is just sitting there looking like they have a dandy old time while the, the first firearms are actually coming through and they're doing a siege. Okay? Very important why that Piper and Drummer is there. And this gives you an idea of what the instruments during that time period look like. Very different than what we have now, um, but they're beginning actually to change so you can actually see the start of what the new Piper would look like, and now you can see all the drums, and these things were huge. The purpose of the music in the military is basically to sound the alarms, transfer orders. The Swiss showed how it was used. It also was used by the Janissaries. It was done very. Um, it was able to manage the army. You didn't have the 18th century field radio, no such thing working. Um, we actually, the fifes and drums can play, and music in general can actually go over long distance, be heard long distances. So it, it augments that officer. We regulate the camp duties. Not everybody had watches. Okay, so, you, so there were certain times of the day that you had the beat duty so the soldiers knew where to go. We regulate the step and the cadence while on the march. Now, it doesn't seem that that's all important in an older army, but in a newer army, you actually can regulate where you're going to be at any one time, because an 18th century army usually sent a quartermaster group ahead of time, and they wanted to know when the men got there, regulating the step, the time out when they had to be there. And of course, we provided entertainment and esprit de corps to the entire army. Remember, not a lot of communities had music. When an army comes into town, they come with their whole, they come with a band. Now, how cool is that? <laughs> and it's one of the times, too, it's like actually being a fight writer be popular. So um, using some real world uh, music in the new world, in 1650, and this is actually in the town records, in 1650, the town of Sudbury, um, a part of the town rate should be appropriated by a drum and a halibut. And halibut is actually is actually a pole arm that actually represents what um, or shows that yes, I'm an officer. In 1652, Severy agreed with Edmund Goodnow that his son shall beat the drum twice every lecture day, twice every forenoon, and twice every afternoon on the Lord's Day. So, question the folks: If you were to listen nowadays, and I know that there's three in this in immediate vicinity, how did most folks actually go and go to church or get alarmed? Church bell. Perfect. Church bells are darn expensive, especially when you're coming into the new world. They were actually went to meeting on the drum. So it was the drum and the drummer had a very elevated status in the early part of the 17th century here because that was how you got your communications up, was by the drum. And it was a lot cheaper than a bell. Um, so in 1660s, um, 1720s, Boston militia includes vice drums and old law. So friend, um, an old law is a French term for high wood or loud wood, and I wish I brought one with me. It is the evil ancestor of the hobo, and it is a loud, loud, loud piece of um, loud instrument. 
So the, um, the oboe, actually, you'll see the three woodwind instruments that show up in, um, in most of the regulations are clarinets, oboe, and fife. So those are your three military instruments during that time. Um, and in 1680s to 1740s, the fife begins to lose popularity. Why? Don't know. It just did. It wasn't, it wasn't in fashion anymore. And so until the dawn of the age, reason came. So the Swiss still were using fifes and drums. And during one of the battles that they had, um, that the British were involved, in 1746, the fife and drum actually came back because one of the young Canavarians that, were, that was actually in, in this particular case, was the Battle of Flanders, actually, um, they saw how that army was regulated, and they figured it was a good time to bring it back. But you can see, actually, there is a fifer and drum, there is a drummer or a fifer back there. And you can barely see him, but he is, whoop. He is right here. And you can see that from, and, and you're going to see later on when I go into the uniforms why it's so important. So reestablishing military music. Prussian army makes great use of uh, fife and drums during the Seven Year War. The ordinance of 1754 reestablishes the duties and the beatings for the French army. And that again changes and is codified and reduced um, in 1767 where it's streamlined. And the French regimental marches are being issued to the different regiments about that time period from 68 to 1760. Um, a lot of the other British groups, um, I didn't have references on the British, but they do the same thing. They, they start issuing tunes to the, um, to the musicians during that time period. So British army school, British music schools begin to instruct fights and drums starting about the 1740s. Um, and the camp duties again become defined. And you'll see what the reason of that is if you have a known piece of music that you're playing, you know exactly what you have to do. Um, American camp duties are actually based on the English system. Um, and Sines, who is a British officer, says um, in his instruction to officers, and von Steuben's Blue Book, which is the, the, one of the first published military manuals in the United States, it also has all the fights and drum music. So you're actually looking at why you have a necessity to have fights and drums in the army. So who's a typical fifer? This gets to the fun part. So <laughs> typical fifer, um, and, and I have the drummers here, but I didn't include it in this presentation. I apologize for the drummers in the room. Um, and Cuthbertson, who is, a, who is a British officer who describes how to run an army and the economy of an army, he states that the fifer, as their duty is not very laborious, it matters how, not how young, they are taken, but when they are strong enough to fill a fight without endangering their constitutions. Filling a fight means they can actually play. As an instructor, I really like to watch my kids when they begin to start fainting a little bit, meaning that they're actually getting it down. Um, and when you get that little bit of hyperventilation, that's how they know that they have to tighten up on their own. So fifers is um, nine or ten could be could be trained as fifers, and you're going to see as we go further on exactly how old these fifers are. Um, me being a fifer, I would not pass muster because I'm way too darn old. I've got other things I should be doing for the army, and fifing is not one of them. So the in the continental army, the average age of musician is about 18 and a half years old, and the fifer's average age as you go further on the road um, in the war actually drops down to 17 years. Um, so, who are they? Again, Tom, um, Cuthbertson recommends that they be orphans or sons to be trained as musicians. There's a reason for that. If you have your family in the army, you're not going to desert. If you are an orphan, the army is your family. Think about that, okay? That is why they did that. So Thomas Nixon and Samuel Deweese actually aligned with this philosophy. Thomas Nixon served from 1775 to 1783 at 13 at the time of his enlistment. He actually could have been younger when he started mustering out, but that was how old he was at the time. He follows his father, Thomas Sr., and his uncle John, later John Nixon. And, and the Nixon family is based out of both Framingham and Sudbury. And one of my reenactment groups actually represents that regiment. He retires as a sergeant, quartermaster, and captain, becomes a surveyor and a master carpenter. Um, Thomas, as going through everything here, and we have his book of papers here, this is probably one of the most fantastic, other than, other than the fight book, one of the most fantastic manuscripts that you're going to see. There is not, in my mind, that I've seen 
a correlation between what somebody did in their free time as what they did as part of their job to be a musician. There's songs in here, there's all sorts of other amusements, and he called it his book of capers. The two together actually give you a very good idea of what somebody in the 18th century actually did. Because as warfare is described, it's described as 95% boredom followed by 5% of abject terror. Um, and that's what an army is in the 18th century. Because while you have a lot of free time on your hand, a lot of time too, you're going to be doing fatigue. So that gives you an idea of how important these manuscripts are. The San Luis, another one, I actually have some accounts um, from a diary, and it's going to be fun, I'll have that a little bit later on. He serves from 1775 until 1783 at 15 at his time of his enlistment. He, again, follows his families into the war, but he is orphaned due to disease, which is very common in the 18th century. Think about right now what's going on in China. You get something like that going on, we'll take a whole regiment out by the knees. Um, and, and disease was very common. One of the most common duties that is actually in the book are the funeral marches, and different versions of funeral marches. Again, probably because they had to do them so many times. Um, he was, um, later he becomes a leather worker and a cord wainer, serves during the War of 1812 that fights in the captain. The reason why I like him is that um, um, not only does he have his, his diary that he talks about who he is, but also, he has to be a captain, nobody can play fight, so he slings his musket and plays fight. I do that all the time, and it's similar to what we do nowadays. Um, again, um, getting, moving on, um, I, I grew up in, in my family, I actually settled Sudbury, so I'm going to use the Sudbury references. Aaron Hayes, who I found is actually one of my ancestors, um, he's a drummer in Captain Hayes' company, and he's, he's 16 at the time of his enlistment. Nathan Hayes, his brother, spelled wrong, same person. Um, Pfeiffer, Captain Hayes Company, 12 at the time of his enlistment, Kayla Brown, Pfeiffer, Captain Nixon's Company, and John Trask, another drummer, Nathan Bent, Pfeiffer, Samuel Smith, Pfeiffer, Captain Russell's Company, and Joseph Cutter, also known as Cutler, and that family is still around, and they reenact, too, as well. Settled Subway, not in 1775, but turns into a drum major. So this is one, what they have, what they call a muster record, um, the muster roll. And you can see here, this is Nixon's company. And actually, this is important, especially for this manuscript, because Thomas goes to fight with his own in the 5th and 6th Regiment. So he's already getting to know the Pfeiffer and drummer. Now, you can see up here, they put all the officers and all the management of the regiment up top. Notice where the Pfeiffer is. Pfeiffer's and drummers are right up with the staff level. So this shows their importance. So we'll use a frame pan example. Simon, Simon Edgel's company in Framingham also marched on the day. So you can see there's a lot of men there. This is a big company. And two little fifers and drummers in their teens are managing about 30 to 50 men and keeping them on the march and telling them what to do during the day. Very important. So the duties of the musicians, they sound alarms, transport orders, as you, as you heard and saw. They regulate the camp duties through music. So there, you'll see later on there are certain duties that are associated with different tasks, regulate the step and cadence, provide entertainment, esprit de corps, carry out punishment to the regiment. Mm. <laughs> Remember those cat of nine tails that they talked about in the 18th century? Guess who carries them? The drum major. Oh. And he is supposed to lay on that punishment. And if he doesn't lay it on, he gets hit by his fife major. So not a very good, not a very good place to be in. So always be kind to your drummers and fighters. Um, they also um, occasionally act as aides and valets to officers. So a lot of these young folks here, and you'll see it um, in a lot of manuscripts, you're actually going to see them learning how to be an officer. In the back of most of these manuscripts, including the capers here, there he's learning how to do his ciphers, which is his. He's learning how to do arithmetic, and he's writing out things. In this book here, I can swear he's actually writing love letters for an officer because they're in there. They're phenomenal. So he's actually acting as that aid by writing out something for somebody maybe who couldn't write or because he thought it was pretty cool to put something for somebody. And he kept a copy. God only knows what he used that for. So the, um, the musician plays an important role in the evolution and management of the armies in the Age of Reason. Status is recognized by their unique dress and their position on the field 
um, as, communi as communications, I'm sorry, the Continental Army lamented the lack of experienced musicians is often lamented by Washington and his officers. So in a typical day, as we started out, as soon as the sky lightens, that's when you look outside and you, the sun's not up, but you can barely see just what the, the trees look like. That's when they start out, when, when the um, day actually starts. That's when drummers call, like we did back there with beat. All the musicians go away from the camp. Now remember, it's got to be away from the camp because if a drummer beats anything, you're alarmed. You're up and moving, okay? It's way out of the way. Um, at daybreak, they come back and the reveille starts. After the roll, you report to the adjutant's tent and you get your jobs. And after that, you regulate who is going to do those jobs during the day. There's always a piper and a drummer at the adjutant's tent. Further instruction in music comes in. This is again where the manuscripts come in. You always need get a manuscript so you can teach folks how to read music, or at least know how to do it by rote. And then after that's free time. And Sam and Dewey actually have some pretty interesting little anecdotes about his free time. I'm not used to this stuff, as you can tell. Okay. Often the orderly drummer will be required to beat up the adjutant's call. The adjutant that's called would, would answer to the call in his presence and receive the order from a superior officer. Sometimes the orderlies would be rented to beat the drummer's or fifer's call on hearing which the fifers and drummers would have to drop everything in answer to our presence. Our duties upon such calls were various. Sometimes we would be required to beat the long roll, roast beef, troop or general, sometimes the rope march, and other times the, I'm going to say the rope march. Um, Again, the women of the camp were, were a problem. Okay, beat the retreat. Um, oh, what they ate. This previous set, um, a drying biscuit, and hearing each day the biscuit was made of ship stuff. And they were so hard that the hammer or a substitute would be required to break them. <laughs> this, of course, throw them and soak them in boiling water upon this a biscuit or herring each day. Each day the soldiers lived until their mouths broke out with scabs and their throats became as sore as raw as pieces of cooked meat. The officer then told us it's very, very um, annoying and impressive what's called the scurvy. So how did they get around this? You'll like this. The soldiers at length determined to kick it upon the receipt of herrings. We all drew our herrings and saved them for a day or two, and then collected them at one place on the parade ground. We fastened them upon long poles, and some so the soldiers carried them upon the shoulders and freed up and down the parade ground while we, the musicians, were playing and beating the roads march after them. We had endured a fish drill for our officers enough and left our fish on, lying on the ground in the parade field to undergo an official inspection and quietly repaired back to our quarters. <laughs> So that's some of the stuff that they did during the day. There's another account here where they talk about actually making balls up out of taking um, taking long grass and actually tying them to balls and playing and then dropping everything and doing precision's call. So um, so there's a lot actually going on. Um, I know why I did that. Um, there's a lot going on actually in the camp and a lot is being regulated and a lot of free time. So going through the camp duties, I'll quickly go through these because there's a lot. Um, we're we're going to actually try to play a few of these for you too. So um, want to make it a little bit interesting instead of just saying, oh yeah, this is what it is, so you can actually hear what they are. Okay. So generals to be when the holes to march. Assembly is, is obvious. Assemble like the folks. The march is from the hole to move. When they beat the march, it's actually um, it's actually just a standard beating. So the drum major picks what beating to use, and the fife major makes the decision to the fifers what tune that matches up to that beat. And a lot of times the drumming, there was very few um, actual drum tunes that went with the fife tune, so it's just a common beating, and you drop tunes in. Okay. Reveille, obvious. Troop assembles the soldiers together for calling the roll and inspecting. Okay. Also, if you have an amalgamated army where you have two regiments together, you also want to know what color you're going to fall in. So what does that mean? If you have two regiments that are together, the officers are at the color. If the regiment is broken up, wherever the color goes, that's where you end up falling into. So that's a point of our, that's a rally point. And it's very important that they show what the troop is and what the color is. Retreat, retreat is not what you think it is. It's the, actually the end of the day when it sounds the roll and for reading the orders, um, orders of the day. Tattoo is for the soldiers to repair to their tents and when they must be there until um, 
um, beating the next morning, I'm sorry. The tattoo actually comes from the Dutch word to turn off the towns. That's where it comes from. And, and it's very important in garrison towns where they beat that up and down up and down the square in order to actually get the men back to camp. So this actually has turned into, if you heard the Edinburgh military tattoo um, and other tattoos like this, it actually <coughs> turns into a lot more than just what it is, what it was originally meant to be, a call to get everybody to camp. It's now part of a much um, like military entertainment. So it's yeah. changed a little bit. Um, to ours is to get everybody together um, while you're on, um, excuse me, the signal for getting everybody under arms. Parlay's desire conference for the enemy. Adjutant's call, call the adjutant's for sergeant call. Um, and this actually from one Stuyven. Rum music is not really spelled out or written out um, and codified in, in one particular way. But so what they do is they write out the um, they write out the rudiments. They have one roll and three flams. Flam, flam, flam. And you play that enough times, that's sort of sergeant's call. And see two two rolls and two flams, or five flams. Go for a wooden water point stroke and a ten stroke roll. This is again in the manual, so now folks can know what's exactly happening and what you have to listen to. Go for wooden walk, go for water, two strokes and a flam, go for provisions, row speed. So point stroke is hitting the head and the rim of the drum at the same time. When you hit it there, the drum goes point. <laughs> Literally. So you hear the ring. So it's a little bit different than just a regular, just a regular tap. Okay. So when you hit it strong enough, that's the point stroke. And a flam, a flam is a, a, a small tap and a large tap. A bum, a dum, a dum. So I'm glad I brought a drummer today. <laughs> the flam. That's a flam. So. Again, these are all spelled out, and, and you can really manage the army knowing what these are. Um, drummer's call, you actually heard that today. We played that the first time. Ba -da 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 -dum, bum, ba -da -da -dum, that gathers us together. The Tea Party, the Pioneers March, and the Church Call, the Parlay. Now, what I can, um, and I'll show you is I actually kind of took the, the music out there so I can show you that. Um, stern warning from Baron von Steuben. Do not play when you're in camp. So the drummers and fifers will practice at 100 paces in front of the battalion at hours fixed by the adjutant general, and any drummer found beating any other time shall be punished. <laughs> Think about that. The drummer is actually regulating the army. Any You hear any noise, and that means something. So that's why you have to, if you're making, if you're playing fifes and drums, it's got to be at a place that you that is known to be a safe place, and if you hear anything in there, ignore it. You're listening for the adjuncts table. So here is just a comparison. It's everything I described before. All armies have different meetings for their reverence, for, for the camp chiefs, excuse me. And in the front there, I actually have some from the French army. It's another, um, just a little bit about reenactors. We do more than just one interpretation. Um, our early war impression here in New England is militia. Our late war impression is usually some established army. Um, my group, our established um, impression happens to be French. Um, so I have those there for you. So later on when we get through, I can give folks some more of the welcome to take a look at the stuff that we have here for you. But what we'll do, let's see if this works. That is the assembly. Um, so this is from uh, this is from Nixon, and it is a number of different manuals. Okay, so we'll play that this for you.
again, they also have different um, different duties by countries. They, they mean the same thing. And we'll probably play a few of those after after uh, we get done with the, with the official part of the of the um, presentation. Um, and afterwards, please feel free to ask questions about all everything that you see here too as well. So field positions of musicians. Remember what Samuel Dewey said. When upon the march in the expedition against the enemy, the musician occupies a more dangerous post than any officer or detachment, say the commander, and when the line of battle in position is not to be envied. I need some volunteers. <laughs> okay, and, and the reason why I need volunteers is gonna pose a question to you folks. Where do you think fifers and drummers actually are in the field? Any any ideas? In the front. Okay, that's that's a good one. Okay. Okay, that's a good one. I need um, probably about three or four volunteers if they want to stand up, um, and we'll see if we can go over here. And I'll show you why. Do I have any volunteers? You guys, come on up. Go on up. I have to hold this chair. Oh, you have to hold the chair. Oh, okay. All right, so you guys are now the army face, face, face of folks. So you guys are pretending to be enemy, okay? So this is where we're aiming. Now I'm going to say one thing. Retreat. Turn around. Ah! <laughs> Does it make sense for me to be behind the army? Nope, because of the muskets. So now where would you think that the army would be or where the musicians would have to be so that they're not in the way. And I'm going to get a hint. Heather is playing the part of a sergeant. On the side. On the side. So, when the sergeant gives the command, I get to echo the command by music. And then when we say retreat, nobody's in our way. So that's where the fighters and drummers are. So if you think about what Tom, thank you. So if you think about what Thomas Nixon is talking, um, excuse me, about Samuel Dewey is talking about, the post other than the commander is the is not to be envied. So here we go. Here's a typical 18th century army. Okay. Now you heard the expression the Continental Line or the Massachusetts Line when they when they describe an 18th century army. It's because it's because of linear warfare. Battle is in this direction here, okay? Here's your army, the enemy would be on the other side. And each of these represents companies, okay? And then the split down the middle, the towns. Okay, so this is, a, this is the makeup of the typical 18th century army. Where are your fighters and drummers? Okay, so now I'm gonna show you right here. In the 18th century, they actually really did have to, to map everything out. So a lot of times, soldiers did not make this, especially the United States, did not make this their career. They couldn't. So they have to mark everything out. So here's your key. So this is how we know where everybody is. Lieutenant Colonel Major, pipes and drums, is there. A few positions of these issues again. Right at the end. So one of these here is your drum major and your fife major. They are smacked in the middle of the company so they could actually, the officer gives the command to the drummer or the, or the fifer, and then it goes from the major down the line. So instead of him yelling, he goes to the, he, he yells to his lead drummer, his drum major, beat the advance. And the advance gets pulled down the entire time, and then they know when they say beat the march. When they beat the march, the hole is to go. So this is how you controlled an army and, and it being very long. They used to do exercises in Europe all the time, and the, one of the executions was is to have all the fifes and drums beat to get everybody to go, and then they used a cannon for the execution. As soon as they heard the cannon shot, boom, off they went. It was an amazing sight. Again, this is field positions musicians again. This is a little bit different. Mr. Pickering, um, who was from Salem, um, was also another, uh, he was the Quartermaster General of Continental Army, he also wrote a book on how to manage the militia or how, how to organize it. So this shows you a couple of things, where the musicians are in the army, but notice that they're now at the head of the column. This is when they're on the march, 
So you have your fifers and drummers were here. When the whole army turns, they're at the head of the column. So when you see on the march, that's where you, you think that actually they're at the front of the column. But in fact, they're normally on the side because when they go from line, from column, back into line when they wheel, the fifes and drums would be back on the right hand side again. So it didn't make a difference whether you wheel to the left or wheel to the right. The musicians are always going to end, um, end up at the ends. It's where they should be. So how many musicians were there? And you can barely see it. This is a very, very good graphic. This is the first original use of spreadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> Just can't get away from this stuff, can you? <laughs> so this is for Fit for Duty. At the time, they had 78 total fifers and 108 total drummers. Unfit for Duty, 92, yeah, 92 and 183 drummers. Turns out that they said, here in this set, it says one thing. Fights, 98, wait a second. I got 78 fit for duty, I have 98 fights that I won. There's a lot of fights that weren't actually being played. They were sharing fights between who was on duty and who wasn't. Think on that one for a minute. But when you come down here and take a look at fight cases, notice they need 183 fight cases. Hmm. If I add those two together, guess what the number is? 183. So they're losing their fights because they have nowhere to put them. So they're, um, and if you see what I'm wearing here is a fife case that keeps everything all together. Um, and the European armies definitely have that as part of their accoutrement. So I'll give you um, some fallacies. So um, prior to myself and a few others doing research, everybody thought that the fifers or the drummers back in the 18th century were Yankee Doodle and that other one. And that's not the case. Um, Thomas Nixon's book has um, well over 144 pages and a lot of tunes in there. I don't know the exact number, but a significant amount and harmonies. It's quite complex, as you heard. And, um, and I'm going to actually defend myself a little bit. I've been playing for so long that each of those tunes has about five or six different versions of it. So Ben and I are trying to figure out which version to play back here. Um, and, and that's for a reason. There's a, a, even though they're the same tune, name, there's slight variations with them. Um, the Fifers did not play strictly in unison. Um, they actually played harmony. Thomas Nixon's Fife book has a number of, um, number of tunes in it that actually has harmonies. And I just was looking at another manuscript. Um, I think it is um, Nathaniel Brown's manuscript from the 4th Connecticut Regiment. And he has seconds and harmonies in there, too. But the only way you can have harmonies is if you have two or more fifers. And as you heard from the demonstration, those fifers got to be in two. All right, so they're getting the supply. So, so they're, they're, the fifers and drummers are becoming better. The drummers play the common beatings. Um, fife pick, the fife major pick the tunes that you're supposed to play to batch for those beatings. Um, and you found out just a moment ago, fifes and drums did not fall in the back. They were on the side with the officers doing command and control. That was their main job. Mm -hmm. Fights and drums did not play all the time during battle. So mm -hmm. I hear this a lot of times in reenacting. There is something called the preparative. Um, then it's going to be what the preparative is. Call out the orders. And I can call out the orders. So this is, this is, a, this is a second model brown vest musket. And yes, I do this too. Um, this is, uh, this is the main weapon for the British Army and the most desirable weapon that somebody in the colonies would want. Um, not until the Charleville muskets started coming in is when they started actually to issue French muskets. But there were a significant amount of French muskets here because of all the prior wars we had. So there's a lot of these muskets around. So I am, I am going to magically, magically this musket is loaded. <laughs> so I hear the preparative for the to fire. Make ready. Present. Fire. Boom. Fire. Load. No, you just don't pull the trigger on these things. Show the locks. Now. When you hear the preparative, that should be the only time that you hear it. It is basically the musical switch for turning on the whole entire company 
After that, the only thing you should hear now is your sergeant. And the sergeant should be giving the commands until you hear um, the ceasefire. And that also is the first part of the church call. Everybody's got to go to church, so everybody knows church call. So, um, so they're just playing the first four, I think it's the four measures, right? First four measures of church call as your ceasefire. So, biggest fallacy, uh, you don't play prepared at every single time in the battle. It just makes things very confusing, and that's what they did back in the 18th century, too, as well. Um, so, if they're in the battle, a lot of times, once they're on ceasefire, they can play Again, the esprit de corps, back and forth going to where they have to go to, and they pick the easier tunes that they can play. It also keeps the men in step. Looking at a huge army in step is a boost to morale to the company that's there. It also scares the Jesus out of the guys on the other side. It means that you're a regular army. So when they say regulars, you heard the regulars are out, the regulars are out. That means they're part of the regular army. These are trained soldiers. Um, and then I said the joke, I'm prepared to play, but not after every single ball. So typical fights and drums. So what Ben and I are playing are actually, um, they're, they're actual reproductions of these type of fights. We've been playing today the Kahusik, the Calendar. Somebody who used to be in the subway company as a minimum militia actually came up to me and said, I have this fight, so I took pictures of it. I said, geez, it looks old. And then we found out about it and said, oh yeah, it's old in its other period. That's why I included it in here. So these are actually in a different, um, these here are actually in the key C. This one actually was in fact the B flat was what you hear nowadays. So you probably have heard that um, as we play the fight, it's a not in tune with itself as it goes up and down. Okay? Not, I'll demonstrate. So scale. Actually, it's now in the B flat, but this is actually in tune with itself. And then you go a little bit further to the modern instruments. You're going to hear a little bit more of it. and more even. So the bison that were being played in the 18th century, they had a completely different um, sound. Their ears were a little bit different. And when you play the actual fice with the tunes that were there, it takes on a completely different timbre. So that's why we're actually we, we're playing those, um, the original bison drums. Oh, one other one? And this is, a, this is another one just to show you just a more modern pipe. And the same, just like the other one I just played. And it has more fun. That's what the answer was. Yeah. <laughs> you can do the same thing with the, with the other fights, but it takes um, it's a regular fingerings that go with them. And it turns out that the, um, each of the fife manuals have what they call a gamut or, gamut or a fingering chart. The fifes that are actually in these keys, actually the fingerings match up with the gamut. Very well. So who were making these fifes? There's two turners in Boston in 1768. And also they're, they're making fifes here locally. We don't know where. There's a number of unmarked fifes that are out there. But there are no, most of your major cities actually had wood turners that can make fights. Um, I don't know about drum makers, they came a little bit later on. Um, but yes, they were making drums here in the United States too as well. I'm not that much of an expert on that. But these are, these are the predominant ones. We know that these here actually were 
um, or could have been played in the 18th century, and they are the style. When I was first doing this, nobody knew what an 18th century pipe looked like. We had a, we had a slight clue, but with um, new research, like Steve Dillon is a collector, um, Joseph's a collector too, and also a pipe maker too, so you can ask them the pipe questions back there. Um, we now have a better idea of not only what they look like, but what they sound like, and it's very much different than, than what you're hearing in a typical pipe and drum company nowadays. Um, so here's one that actually, so they're using, again, cut down to the supply. They're making a pipe here out of pewter. Pewterer just came up and they're making the pipes out of pewter. Another pipe I had and I didn't put up the picture is an old pistol barrel. <laughs> they were so desperate they were taking pistol barrels and that were worn or blown and they were going through and remaking them into instruments. Mm -hmm. And that's what the uh, sticks look like during the 18th century too as well. So we have a few others. Each of the army had their own different instruments. And what I did here is, um, and show you more examples. So we have a we have a French pipe, which is in the key of D, and then a German pipe. And this German pipe actually is based on um, it's based on an example in a museum in Berlin, made by Joseph back there. Both of these were actually made by him back there. Um, this pipe actually, a friend of mine was in the French army. And he went through and he was lamenting the fact he couldn't find a French pipe anywhere. And he went to his former commanding officer and uh, he says, oh, and as Luke is lamenting, he's reaching in the back and he pulls out, you mean one of these? <laughs> so he actually had one. And this is going to sound a little bit different. So this has harmony. So this gives you an idea. This is an alternative. You just play it. Just the first one. One, two, three. Switzerland, when they play the pipes, they're still in the same key. They really haven't changed that much. Um, this pipe is a little bit different, and as you're going to hear, I'm just going to play one one back there. So it's about where the E getting to the B, it sounds really weird. But this is what they're used to in the 18th century. It's kind of imperfect, but perfect at the same time. It's pretty cool. You get fighters together that really know what they're doing. As long as the fights are pitched together, it sounds pretty darn good. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we'll continue on. So I'm just going to quickly go through these. Um, as we started to make fights in the United States, they started actually um, going, and I would say they were codifying or standardizing, I would say, on B flat. And that was both in the in in the United Kingdom as well as in the United <coughs> States. And fights now are being made in quantities. And I only went up to the 19th century because after that things really get, get strange. Now, I can see I brought up a rock here. Um, fights that are made out of boxwood have a tendency when it gets damp that they actually <laughs> will bend. So that, that wasn't put in there. That actually is moist. <laughs> so the fight made a better barometer than <laughs> And these are, um, again, you can see that what, what we have out here, even if it's the 19th century, it still looks the same. They're still making the same type of fights. It's not until the 20th century where things really, and the late 19th century, things get strange. And then German and Swiss fights. Some of these actually, we took pictures in the Basel Museum, which is actually fantastic. And they have a number of these fights there. And the French fights, different than this little guy here, they started to play around with a few other keys, inventing, and 
this became this just was saying the standard French wife up until today. Drums. Anybody know? Anybody know who plays this drum? <laughs> Probably one of the more famous drums here in the United States is William Diamond's drum. I pull this trick on the William Diamond Fison drums all the time. I said, guys, you know who play that drum? Mm -hmm. so, it's your namesake. <laughs> these are these are European drums. Um, the Basel Museum has a fantastic collection of, of drums. And you can see the same type of uh, the same type of style, rope tension with the ears, and then they, and a lot of times a strainer that was added after and the snare drum. Um, is actually a relatively new invention to the 18th century. About the time of the Seven Years' War, a lot of drums were not played with strainers, they would sound like tom-toms. Then they started to put the, um, those two pieces of cat cut across the bottom, and it really picked up the uh, timbre of the instrument and also the um, distance for which the drum can be heard. Again, some more Basel drums. I'm using this as an example because they have such a great collection and they're, and they're not broken up, they're very well maintained. So typical dress of a musician in the 18th century um, as the importance of signalers. Now, now since you saw and, and hopefully made it um, known how important musicians are, you need to find them on the field. It's very important that you find the uniform of the uh, musicians on the field. There, what, so they, what, what they ended up doing is they actually went and changed the colors on the uniforms slightly. So you can know that with the same type that they are, in fact, a musician and not a soldier, okay? So the, the three types of uniform changes I've seen, um, and you see this all the time in the 18th century armies, and it's only three practices. One is reversing the colors of the uniform. What does that mean? Well, in the 18th century, you have, for, at least for the uh, soldiers, you had one coat which had, had a body color, and let's say it's blue for the Americans then a facing color would be a little bit different. So in New England, we had white facings on our coats from 1779 on to the end of the war. That changed to a red facing. What they did is they made musicians in red coats with blue facings, same army, but you could actually find them because they're a little bit different. So if the officer needed to find the musician, they're looking for the person in the red coat or the white coat or something different from the army. Um, fixed colors for musicians. This is practiced by the French and the German armies, and I have an example here. Um, one of the coats up the front here, and I'll have a better picture, French army were in white, all the musicians were in blue. And the other one is um, it's additional uniform lace, they just would put additional lace on there, and that would identify the musician as different from the regular army. So German British war, it's basically, I'm not gonna go into this too much, but it basically talked about reverse colors unless, unless the, um, the the regiment had buff facings, where then the musicians were in red, small clothes. Yeah, imagine washing that. That was it was pretty nasty. Um, and the fifers and drummers had caps. Not this. This is a this is a um, militarily cocked hat or a civilian hat um, made in the same way. Caps are just basically a cap, and they had a different headgear, so you could actually see them too as well, being a little bit different. So this is what you what you have. So you have the so this is a buff face uniform. He's using he's got red breeches on. The rest of the drummers there. This this is the 10th regiment, which is local to this area. They just wore the reverse colors, and they have just the standard white breeches. Caps are these grenadier bonnets. With the Americans, they basically had a um, a felt cap. It was basically a cut down. Bad, bad tricorn and bad military cocked hat, and they repurposed it by turning it into caps. Early War American troops, dressed like Ben and I are right now, which is basically, basically your militia. But in this particular case, I have all my 9 and 10-year-old drummers are actually behind the line. So they're getting ready before, they, uh, before we pull them out, so they're doing inspection. We have them in the rear during inspection, we pull them to the side as soon as we get into battle. So this is what it would have been nice to have if we actually had the means to do it. But this is the 79 uh, regulations. This looks really cool. I hope we have a look like this. Um, <laughs> the supply was so terrible in the 18th century that they could get what they they could get what they could get. But in this particular case here, there was a couple of regiments that were actually able to um, meet the regulations. In 79 also, and here's a, here's a, a good example 
of showing the reverse colors is that the body of the coat for the soldiers buffed because New, New York and New Jersey were given buff faces. The, the um, musician is actually in the reverse color, and there's that cap we're talking about. And other continental uniforms. So basically, here's reverse red facings. In the summertime, they wore a hunting frock. You couldn't really tell the difference during the summertime because it's just economy. The wool coats are very heavy. Having the hunting frock, everybody's wearing the same thing. And the Marines also, they wore, um, they were also green coated white face regiments and they also wore the same coat as the, um, the drummers wore the same coat as their um, infantry. I'm going to put that in. That's my five member company with Dan. Um, so we're wearing the reverse colors of um, our parent regiment. And you can see here, again, there's our color bearer who is part of the army. And then we have the reverse cases. Reverse colors. French troops. So French troops, the, um, the body, again, the, um, the Metropolitan Army was in white coats with different facing types and different, um, different colors on there. Musicians wore, always wore blue color coats, so you can find them in a lot of ways. They're owned by the king. So here, they have the drummer, and that's called livery de Wap, means that they're owned by the king. All the drummers have that lace on there. And this is what the parent regiment looks like. Then we have some German troops fighting underneath, um, fighting underneath for the for King Louis, and this is for the Royal de France, which actually came to the United States. And there is a fantastic painting, and I should have included it, where they are actually at the end of the line playing, and they're playing fifes, drums, oboes, and clarinets together. I would have loved to find out what that sounded like. Mm -hmm. That would have been really fun. Um, and then the typical. Typical uniforms during that time period. German troops, most were in blue depending on um, principality, but here's where they add in a lot of that lace color. So that's how the total difference. Okay, that's basically the end of my talk. Um, but I always get this, some people say, ask about, uh, so what's it like to be a reenactor? You know, what do you do, what can I do? Um, there's a number of different groups that are in the area that if you're interested in doing that, you know, Tony back there, Tony and I belong to the Surrey Companies and the Militia, um, and he also was in the, the Fort Foot 2 as well. Um, a lot of folks do not only the militia stuff, but also the British stuff as well. Um, a number of local groups around that do that. We also have um, fights uh, and drum groups around there that do free instruction. I, right now I'm teaching the William Diamond fights and Drums, taught for age, been with one of my students. Um, so it's good to have the generation um, and the hobby actually going to the next generation, so that's a good thing. Um, what are your responsibilities? Oh, and my daughter. <laughs> Why are you? <laughs> She's also in the William Diamond group right now, too, so you was. But, but um, that's how I got involved with those folks. Yeah. So, folks have any questions? Yeah, let's start over here. So, so you guys were really important on the battlefield. Yes, we were. <laughs> so was there any kind of battlefield etiquette that you don't shoot these guys? Yeah, it's a, the battlefield etiquette was not to shoot the musicians, and fortunately that etiquette happens today too as well. Um, very bad to shoot the musicians. But, um, but there are some very well-known accounts of where that didn't happen. Um, everybody know who um, Tarleton is? He, he, is, he, is the, um, he was known as the Green... Green Dragoon, he was in a loyalist regiment, and he was not a very kind guy. There is a case where um, he was going up against another uh, Dragoon group, and that Dragoon um, and that musician basically said they were they want a quarter, meaning that they're not a combatant. So with cavalry, he took both of his pistols, put them underneath his thumbs, and he's holding his hands up like this with his thumbs in the trigger boats. And he got cut down by his by Charlton's troops. Well, what did I have earlier? If you're a musician, most of the time you're serving with your family members. His father saw him get cut down. So, of course, the battle did not go Charlton's way, and they had a number of um, a number of prisoners left behind. And they, in, in what they said, we afforded them the same courtesy as they afforded my son or afforded our musician. 
So yeah, not very kindly done, but yes, it, it did happen, but not so often. I'll, go, I'll build on that a little bit. In Thomas's, Thomas Nixon's fight book, there, um, he served during um, Saratoga. Actually, the musicians got together because it's known that there's about more than just the two hands between, um, between Joshua or Jonathan Long and Thomas Nixon. There's actually hands in there from what we think is a British fight nation. So they actually were going back and meeting with them, and they were, they were sharing music. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. You got two lines of troops, the enemy. Okay. The drummers are the side. Yep. How many drummers are there to the side? How many drummers are at the side? Yeah, one or fourteen? No, nope. that's a very good question. Um, as you saw in the order, um, excuse me, in the muster roll, there is about one fighter, one drummer for a company. So a company could be as little as 20 to as much as 50. Okay? Uh, and that varied throughout the war. So that one fighter and one drummer is taking care of those 50 men. When the regiment gets together in a whole, all of those fighters and drummers are with their companies. But, they, but the drum major and the fight major and probably one or two chosen folks, probably the two that were at the adjutant's tent, are actually in the center of the regiment with the officers. And they're the ones that are beating the call, and that call is, is coming from the center and going out to the wings. Okay, now in a sense, it's well organized, but also it's confusing. Right. That leads me to another question. Sure. I have been led to believe that they were all gentlemen, 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 gentlemen on both sides. Right. There's certain regulations you didn't do. It seems to me the enemy would try to get the drummers, so that way they you lose, you lose all communication. We are unit. But the same thing could happen on the other side. Well, that's it, true. So what it, happens? They both go after the drummers. It, it depends, but it, yes, you're right. Command and control is based on the fighters and drummers, but also that wasn't a standard practice. Um, also, too, you have to remember, those, these firearms here are not all that accurate at a distance. Um, as a matter of fact, if you get beyond 75 yards, you might as well shoot at the moon. Um, because you're not, the ball is just going to take whatever windage it's going to go to. So you really can't, you really have to either have a rifleman or a cavalryman to actually go down or, or it's close enough to bayonet them to actually get to the musicians. And when you get that close, the army is protecting the musicians too. Okay, well. one more question. Sure. When he was drumming, you were firing, you had so many seconds to reload. Mm -hmm. What happens? Did you actually pour, rip it off and pour? You did. What happens if it's kind of a damp day? <laughs> <laughs> Your SOL. <laughs> I'm really good at this. I'm glad I'm gone now. Okay. Wow. Get the point? <laughs> uh, so this, so the bayonet actually was used for that reason. You have to remember too, in the 18th century warfare, prior to the muskets coming onto the field, we had pikemen. If you ever gone down to um, Plymouth Plantation, when they go through the when they go through the drill military drills, what makes up the bulk of the Minutemen or the militia that were at Plymouth Plantation? The pikemen. So, and then they have the muskets, which are matchlock muskets, and, and actually it was a pikeman that protected the men. So when, they, when muskets became more prevalent, they started off turning the musketeers into, um, or the pikemen into musketeers, but they also knew the limitations of a black powder weapon, that they had to put something on the end of the musket. So what started off is they said, well, we'll just take this little knife. The little knife made a day on, which they call the bayonet. Um, Step that right at the end, but then you can't actually use the musket until the socket bayonet is. Now with the socket bayonet, it goes over the barrel, and then this way you can load and fire. Now we do something we call experimental archaeology. Now if you pulled out this rammer, you would think, oh, the easiest way to do it is this way. Look what happens. Yeah. <laughs> so you go there, and it's. Thump, thump, thump. And it goes in. So it clears the socket bayonet, 
and the drill that had to come with it evolved so that you could use the musket with the socket. So if you lose, you lose that rod, you're out of, out of business. Well, not particularly. Um, the balls in the 18th century are very, very small. And so literally, um, you could do what they call a Swedish tamp, which is you load the musket, take the ball, put it on top, ram the musket on the ground. Most of the time, it'll hit the ground. It'll go down to the bottom because the ball is a lot smaller than the board. So that's because they wanted to quit. Accuracy wasn't the game with these muskets. It was how much lead was in the air that they cut everybody did. So, okay. <laughs> you I'll give you one more, but we got other folks here. You turn around and load it up. You pull the satchel up and you rip it. What if you don't have any teeth? You, <laughs> what if you don't have any if teeth? If you're in militia, you have to have two matching teeth. <laughs> yeah, because carrying it on. Okay, as, yes, you could probably load with it. You could probably load with, um, as they did in the 18th century. If you're not in a battle situation, you can load by the you can load by the horn. But all armies in the 18th century had cartridges and cartridge boxes. So you could they, you could take your one or two shots prior to the whole regiment, and it was particularly with the militia. I'm talking more the militia now. The army, all they had was cartridges. But in the militia, it had both their powder horns and their cartridge boxes. So the, your cartridge box. Was, was needed for rapid fire. You're not fumbling for your horn. You've got one cartridge that's already been pre loaded ready to go. Thank you. Good. Question over there, sir. Did the uh, fighting continue into the Civil War? The fighting continued all the way up, believe it or not, into the 20th century. Yeah. There are actually there are actually <laughs> recordings of um, the 5th, the 5th, the Daily 5th New York Regiment um, on an Edison cylinder. And I've heard it, it's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And it's a very different style. But yes, they stick out. Sorry. Is the fife open or closed at the end? Um, it's closed at the mouthful end and open at the other end. So yeah, there is a cork in there. Where that cork, um, moving that cork actually changes the tune. So the further, the further you move it away, uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> no, you, all right, sorry. He's right, you tune the fife or not the fife. A fight is a fixed tuned instrument. It doesn't typically have a tuning cycle of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So once you plug the tone holes into the side, you can't move that cork. If you do, everything else has to move with it, and you physically cannot move those tone holes. They're already drilled into the thing. Mm -hmm. So if you move the cork, you mm -hmm. tune the time or your, your basic note, and everything else goes wonky. Which means they sound worse out of tune than the historic models that you play. <laughs> okay. Good question. Yes. One question. When you were showing the different tunes at the beginning, yep. that were the activities of the day, etc. Mm -hmm. How does the average militia man know what those <coughs> tunes are? They they, sort of, like I said, they seem sort of similar, but it seems like... Mm -hmm. yeah, they, they can tell the difference between the petite call and the roast beef um, very well, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Sorry. So I'm going to say I actually had a Right, I'm going to, instead of going through the memorization um, of what Sam and Dewey said, he said that, um, so they had fatigue call and they had roast beef. Um, roast beef is your provision call. Fatigue call means to go over. So he said, when, when we in the company beat the, beat the fatigue call, the men slowly got themselves out of their tents and they got in line with the sergeants with the fights and drums. And he said, that's compared to the roast beef where they daily came out of their tents dancing on their way because they knew they were going to do that. And, and that was based on what we had in here. So yes, they did know the difference between a lot of those calls. And they're simple enough, you've got to remember too, that it's like a different alarm in your alarm clock. Um, that, that's been beat into them as what those calls actually mean in the company. Good question. Yes? I would think that when the men were lined up in a war situation and they were getting their, their instructions from the instruments, mm -hmm. they were probably pretty quiet. Yes, yeah. Having military bearing and silence was, was imperative, because they're not only getting, they're not only getting the, um, I would say, the rough instructions from the fighters and drummers, they're getting the detailed instruction from the, from the sergeants and the corporals. So the, um, so the, the fighters and drums basically told you to go from one place to another, 
when to start and when to stop. But on some of the loadings, the officer is actually getting some of those commands, or if there's a ceasefire where there's something in the front, that's actually done by the uh, corporals within, within. A verbal? Verbal, yeah. So, so basically, the fight and drum is the extension of what the officer is giving out, and to a certain extent, the speed uh, sergeants. Okay. Yes? The uh, musicians played Reveille to wake the troops. Who woke the musicians? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. The musicians. Um, in an 18th century army, there was always an adjutant, um, there was always a fife and drummer at the adjutant's head. So they were the ones that took care of not the whole fife and drum company, a fifer and a drummer posted with the adjutant. And when it got to a certain point, then that's when the, um, you would hear the meeting for musicians call. So who will pull okay. He was, it's 24 seven. So you have one person that is, that is going around the clock. There's always a fight for a drunk in that adjutant's tent. He's either sleeping, but he's there. If somebody comes by, wakes the adjutant, wakes the drummer. He's the one that gets the alarms, the quote unquote alarms the camp. So that's what they're doing. And also, there are, there's always pickets that are out there um, with, a, with the company. So the French Army, um, and I've got a great picture of it, in the French Army, they, they show this great picture of what a tent looks like. And believe it or not, seven, between six to eight men slept in those tents. Now, not crosswise, but stacked up by like logs. So if the tent pulls going this way, the men are lined up this way. The two men at the end are actually fully clothed. And they have one guy that's sleeping because he's going to get woken up later on that night by somebody in that tent group who wants to go back to bed again. So they always have two men that are fully dressed, ready to go. And this is at least in the European army. I would, um, and I'm trying to find more information in the American army, and I have no doubt it's the same way. Because they also had pass calls, too. So if you're going back and forth, what's the pass call? They did that a lot, and they, and they still even do that today, not so much with radios, but they, they kept doing that in the 18th century. And you needed to know what the pass call was. Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> Anything you want. The only, my only rule is that the only silly question is the one that never gets asked. And if you have any questions afterwards, just let me know. Oh, yeah, one more. Um, yes. In the 18th century, were most of the flags seen? That's a good question. Um, and well, you heard the demonstration that we had up front there. Yes. So those are typically what they had. There were some fights that were in B, there were some fights that were in C, and some fights that were in B. Typically for the 18th century, right, probably going into the 19th century, the most common instrument was in the pitch in the key of C or the key of D, or somewhere in between. Um, it, it varied, but um, eventually in the, in the middle part of the, I would say the first quarter going to the half of the 19th century is when they started to codify the keys. Yeah. Good question. Good question. Anything else? Well, thank you, folks. I appreciate your time. I hope you enjoyed it.